mayores ciudades del mundo, y como se puede ver con vida, en el tema de la barra para la en San Pedro de Agua, y en una definición de la historia del que buscó el castillo de Coral, que tenía una silla de aviador, que giraba sobre el que supuestamente lo podía utilizar para crear su residencia. Y cuando me entra en su barra para la también ella, en su libro, dice que los santomentos que también ella caracterizaba, también le dijeron que dando tres votos sobre uno mismo, deben poder acceder a las comisiones superiores. Thank you. 
Father. I would add, like to add to this. I think that there is no direct, 100% sure causal relation. That means that there is no guarantee that if you do certain movement, you will succeed in what you want to succeed. It, gives, it can give you the opportunity to do so, but if it's not already coded somehow inside you, you will, it will give you just the illusion, but it will be just the illusion. For some people, it can be spinning. For some other people, it can be some kind of meditation. For some other people, it will be go into sleep and dream. It's different for everybody. Everybody's it's different. Everybody's but tradition, shamanism, religions, and so on, develop it certain kind of motions that are famous for producing the effect more often than just doing anything random. That's what I as a sign. Thanks.
plants, medicinal plants, it's available. Of course, the, the tobacco companies have loaded cigarettes to poisons and, you know, to help them to be implicated in certain disease processes so that it would all be blamed on tobacco, on the tobacco itself. Um, but the thing is, is that uh, smoking tobacco, if it's not you know, loaded with every kind of you know, evil chemical known to man, which a lot of cigarettes are, it actually increases the acetylcholine receptors in your neurons. Um, smoking tobacco is a pain reduction uh, technique for people with autoimmune conditions. Um, particularly people with rheumatoid arthritis benefit from it. You know, if, they, if you have, start having pain, smoke a little bit and your pain goes away. Um, where is Gabby? Um, one of our research researchers, uh, Dr. Gabriela Segura, uh, who is a cardiac surgeon, has done some really extensive research on it, and we've published many, many articles on the topic on our website, and they are well researched. And we have found out also that all of the research that is against smoking has been paid for by companies that have a vested interest in lying. And you know, since we are kind of in the science business, my husband is kind of in the academic business, you know, we know how science gets slanted and corrupted by who gets paid for what. That's what I just read that quote from Fred Hoyle. You know, people who do research, you know, they do research based on money. So um, yeah, we've asked them, and yeah, we've kind of done research, and yeah, for, the, for many people, once again, it's individual. Not everybody needs to smoke. But for many people, it can be extremely beneficial. And plus, which you notice that the powers that be that ban it for everyone else, did you know that they reversed the ban on smoking in the European House of Parliament as well as in the Congress of the United States? They're allowed to smoke there, but none of us are. Think about it. I want to add something. If you study the history of science and see what happened in, say, 18th, 19th century, and you see that most of famous scientists, they were smoking. Researchers, they were smoking either pipe or cigarette. And they were smoking not because there uh, was a big advertisement by this kind of brown, by other kind of brown. It was 18, 19 century. So they were smoking for some reason. Okay? Apparently smoking helped them to concentrate, helped them to focus, focus on some idea. And then why Niels Bohr, Albert Einstein, they were all times smoking pipe or cigarettes or whatever. Okay. So there, there must have been a good reason for that. Today, it's forbidden. Before, it was a sign of someone who concentrates. Today, it seems concentrating is not the right thing to do. You are not supposed to do that. Someone wants to prevent you, okay? But as Laura said, it's individual. I was smoking for many years. <coughs> then I abandoned smoking for around about 20 years. I could work without smoking. I could concentrate. I wrote my book, my monograph about Kaluza Klein theories. I developed many things without smoking. But then at a certain at a certain point, I said, "Well, okay, that's how far I can go without smoking. It's not really necessary for me." But I see that so many people and scientists that I really appreciate were smoking. Perhaps it adds something. I know how to work without smoking. Now I know, I know how to work with smoking. But one has to be careful. Okay, first, it's individual. 
For everybody it can be different. And second, it depends what kind of tobacco you smoke. And what kind of paper is there. What chemicals are added. Okay? There are many environmental issues. In what kind of environment you are living. What kind of chemicals are around you. What is your diet? I mean, because everything combines. A human body is a very complicated mechanism. And sometimes you can afford certain things, like smoking if you have the right diet, and you have uh, the right way of living, you do some exercise and so on. For some other people, it can damage your brain, damage your body, damage everything. So, that's the answer.
And while we, the first night in the hotel there in Trieste, I turned over in bed. I mean, I swear to God, all I did was turn over. I didn't do anything weird. I didn't, you know, jump, jerk, pop, anything. And a herniated disc in my neck. And I don't know if any of you have ever had a herniated disc, but let me tell you what, it, that will turn you into a screaming animal, uh, back up in the corner, you know, like this, you know, don't come near me, because that's how bad it hurt. And hotel doctors, you know, neck braces, got through the trip, you know, lots of drugs, got home, nothing touched it, nothing made it better. It was just really horrible. And then finally I broke down because I was, you know, trying to go with just pain medication and not anything that you do. You broke down with the doctor and he put me on some major high doses of cortisone. And, you know, like the next day after I took this, I was cleaning the garage, you know, and dancing around, and I felt great. Oh, you know, I mean, I feel like a 20-year-old on this medication. And I thought about it, and I said, you know, um, cortisone is the most powerful anti-inflammatory they make, especially when they're giving it to me, the doses they gave it to me, it was probably like, you know, the most they could give anybody. And I said, okay, so if everything, and I mean, not only was it my, my neck, it was my low back, it was my knees, it was my elbows, it was my fingers, it was my head. I mean, I could even think better. And I said to myself, obviously everything that's wrong with me is inflammation because an anti-inflammatory fixed it. Problem is, what is the cause of the inflammation? And that's what started me researching. And I continued to research and I was making little changes here, little changes there. Joe can tell you, he got driven crazy. He asked me one day, what diet are we on this week? So, you know, I was trying different things, and uh, it still wasn't getting me where I needed to go, even though I was still getting somewhat better, because at this point, my shoulder just completely went. I mean, I had so much pain in my shoulder, I couldn't. If I were sitting like this, I wouldn't be able to reach out and pick up this glass. I couldn't do it. I mean, it was like, I mean, I was really crippled. So. And that's part of, you know, it's hard for people, you know, who can see me, you know, walking around, moving around to understand, you know, like I had trouble dressing myself. All I could do was sit in front of my computer and write. So I ended up having surgery because I was in so much pain I had no choice. Because they, at this point they had been giving me cortisone injections directly into the joint a couple of times. And that wasn't doing, it wasn't, I mean, it's a, it's a really long needle. And I went in and I had the microsurgery done, and then I came out of the hospital, I thought, you know, I felt fine, my shoulder didn't hurt anymore, I said, okay, great. But the unfortunate thing was, was that then, you know, the brain fog set in, and I really got to the point where I couldn't even speak a coherent sentence. And I thought, you know, this is really terrible. I depend, I mean, what I am, what I do is, I figure things out, I think about things. I mean, if I can't think, if I can't construct a coherent sentence, I'm in really deep deal. I am just, you know, I'm going to throw me out the window, get rid of me. <laughs> so scared, pure living, bejeebies out of me. And I started researching. And I found out that a lot of the drugs that they put into me while I was in the hospital having surgery, plus a lot of the stuff that I've been eating throughout my life, plus a lot of the other surgeries I've had, because this was my sixth major surgery, um, were toxic waste in my body. And I, and I thought at first, oh my God, there's nothing I can do about it. I'll toxify myself, I might as well just, you know, die. And then I found out that you can reverse toxicity, but the, you know, that it's a process. So I, was, I started reading books on it, and I got an infrared sauna blanket, and I started changing my diet, you know, and I was making adjustments this way, adjustments that way, you know, all these different things. And this went on for a period of, uh, oh, a couple, three years, and I was getting much better, and I was, yes. Yeah, I'll tell you right now that Cutting out all um, simple carbs and all gluten-containing pro products probably had one of the most profound effects on my body of anything else. I mean, at that point, I could sit at my desk for five minutes before my legs swelled so bad they were like little shiny sausages, and I had to get up and lay down and put my feet up again. So. I read about the, you know, the evils of dairy, and gluten, and sugars. So I cut those three things out. And I used the infrared sauna blanket 
uh, for one week, and at the end of one week, all the swelling in my legs was gone and has never come back. Never. And, you know, I mean, you, you, you go to the supermarket, you see old ladies that have their ankles swell so that they fall over their shoes, you know, and you think, oh God, I don't want to get there, I don't want to have that happen. Oh, that's really looks so awful. But that's where I was. So, I did that, and then we continued going on, and then last year, and we've been playing around with a modified paleo diet, you know, just kind of like, we've just eaten like meats and plenty of vegetables and everything except nothing with gluten, nothing with sugar, and no dairy. But it was still a pretty varied diet. And then last uh, Christmas, uh, and, and my son, you know, everybody in the house, we were experimenting on ourselves. And he was eating this, and I, and I kept pushing those vegetables, eat more vegetables, eat more vegetables, you know, and he kept having these problems. He'd had this irritable bowel syndrome since he was low. And it just kept getting worse and worse. And I kept thinking, you're, you're not eating enough vegetables, eat more vegetables, eat more vegetables. And just pushing it and pushing it, and then finally, day after Christmas, he ends up in the hospital, he had such an infection in his insides, he's 25 years old, he went to take his colon out. <laughs> And we went in to talk to the gastroenterologist and we said, you know, he has to have a colonoscopy. We don't want you to take his colon out, put him on antibiotics, go in and look and see what you can do. You know, we have to make some decisions here. Okay, three days before he can have the colonoscopy because he's got to get his colon cleaned out. How do you get, how do you get his colon cleaned out? We have to eat a special diet. What diet do you eat to clean your colon? And you know what he said? Huh? What do any of you think? I want some answers. What do you think you eat to clean your colon? Meat. No vegetables. If you have a colonoscopy, you cannot have a single vegetable for three days before you have it done. This gastroenterologist sat there and told me that. And I said, you mean to tell me that all of this stuff that people are saying about eating fiber for keeping your colon clean is bull? Oh, no, you still need to eat vegetables, but you're telling me that you don't eat vegetables to do a colonoscopy because it cleans your colon and stops the irritation. That's what you're telling me. A gastroenterologist in a hospital, trained by a medical, a medical school, he's telling me this. And he says, yeah. And I couldn't understand the disconnect. This man is telling me what he knows from his medical training. He doesn't want to go in a colon that's all inflamed and dirty. No gastroenterologist wants to do that. You know, clean. <laughs> and they know how to clean it. And they know what stops irritating it. They know it because they're trained. And then they turn around and say, oh, but you got to eat your vegetables. <laughs> So, 14 days, or 15, or maybe 16, 16 I think, I ate that. at least about six, almost three weeks, um, two or three kinds of the most powerful antibiotics known to man, through his, you know, through his veins, because he couldn't take anything in his stomach. Saved his colon, he came home, and he started eating meat. You know, we're watching this. You know, we're all around the house here, because we're still, you know, we're still in this totally healthy, you know, fresh meat and lots of vegetables. You know, we're watching this kid. And he, we started him out on veal, you know, just a little, and he could only eat a tiny little bit, because remember, he hadn't had anything in his stomach for 16 days. He was on a little bit of veal. You know, I mean, what do you usually eat when you have any eaten days? I mean, they tell you to have gruel, or you have uh, rice cereal, or you have, but if we gave him that, he started bleeding again. I mean, this was like the canary in the mine. So we watched him. And he just got better and better and better. And then we started, we started doing some research. And that's when we got onto this whole paleo diet thing. And we started reading all these books. And we started saying, we like, this information <coughs> is there all the time. It's just we weren't looking for it because we weren't ready to receive it. We were still, you know, you got to be holy by eating vegetables kind of thing. So we all started, and this was back in 
by the time by the time we became convinced by my son's example, because he literally can't eat anything else, he literally can't. But we, you know, they're all the rest of us. We we have a little leeway. He has none. He cannot. Uh, so we started in April, first of April, there was. Yeah. Right around the first of April, we all kicked on to this paleo diet. And I mean, we literally eat almost nothing but meat. We eat no grains, we eat almost no vegetables. Once, we may have vegetables three or four times a week. And, you know, maybe we eat a little salad or something. But we don't eat any broccoli, no cruciferous, no cabbage, no... And I mean, and we've gotten to the point where... And, I, and I'm going to tell you something that's going to kind of freak you out, but you know, when you eat mostly meat, you have almost no stool, and it doesn't stink. And you no longer have any gas whatsoever. Yes. You have no bloating. You know, it's, it's, and you eat less. So, you want to read the books? There's a book called Prime of Body, Prime of Mind. She also talks in that book about rejuvenation research that apparently a uh, very high fat, uh, moderate protein diet can cause the telomeres on your DNA to repair and can reverse the aging process. People have been known to start having their white hair turn back to its normal color again after <coughs> going on these particular kinds of diets. Um, that's all I can tell you, you know. We don't eat to be pure or holy, just so you know that. We eat to optimize our health. Because we, I mean, how can you do anything for humanity? How can you do anything for yourself or for anybody else? If you're not healthy, you don't feel well. Next. Uh, I want to add something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to have the last word. <laughs> I had some discussion with vegetarians or vegans or whatever. And I notice that people that are vegetarian consider themselves as a very peaceful people. You know, like in India, it's a peaceful country. Everything you achieve by essentially non-aggressive methods. So vegetarians consider themselves as being less aggressive than meat eaters. However, what I observe is that a vegetarian is not that peaceful mm -hmm. if you could start questions his vegetarian things. <laughs> I tell you, the articles we published on our SOT website about the uh, you know, about uh, the product, the paleo diet and basically kind of against vegetarian way of life, I have never in my life encountered such a provocation of violent invective as those articles. I mean, every vegetarian in the, uh, on the entire internet zeroed in on that, and they were in there posting their nasty, you know, what, oh, it's just unbelievable. It was worse than smoking. <laughs> we publish pro-smoking articles. I mean, we get you know every anti-smoking you know weirdo on the net comes along and flames us. But I'm sorry, I'm not in the business of publishing things because it's popular. I'm in the business of publishing it because the research supports it. Next. Really is kind of about balance. 
and it's the job of you know each individual to to choose which way they're going to go, what they're going to believe, and I think that choosing what you believe can have a profound effect on your on your DNA, on your on your you know your emotional system, everything. Um, so I think it's pretty apparent if you if you want to if you want to explore those things further, I would recommend the works of the Sufi Shaykh Ibn Al Arabi who wrote extensively on the many faces of God, and that there are the two primary, you know, like just like there is in computer language, you know, on and off, good and bad, positive and negative, and uh, then it, you know, breaks down from there. I mean, think about this, uh, this image that Art showed earlier, you know, that he got from Burkhard Hein, of this, of this model of these uh, seven levels, you know, and how at the highest level was the pneuma, which was uh, the breath. And Ibn al-Arabi talks about the breath also. So, I mean, other than saying that, I, don't, I, I wouldn't have any other idea of what you want me to, how you want me to answer this question. I mean, there's two faces, there's two sides, there's good and evil. And um, just as there is, you know, everything that can be, there's everything that isn't. Everything has two faces. Sufficient under the day is the evil thereof. Tell about the context. There is the context which is high. Yeah, so there's a. Um, sometimes something can appear to be evil and is really good, and vice versa. Because there is the context. There is good and there is evil, and there is a specific situation that determines which is which. That's extremely important. Because sometimes telling the truth can be damaging. For example, if you were a, re were a resistance fighter um, during a war, and you know somebody asked you who your fellow resistance fighters were, and you believed so strongly in telling the truth that you could not tell a lie, you could get everybody you know killed. So in that particular situation, telling a lie is good. However, there are other situations where telling a lie is bad. For example, if you're, you know, asked to testify about something and, and the judge asks you to tell the truth and what, what you say can save somebody's life, you know, you're required to tell the truth. You know, it says in, it says in the uh, Ten Commandments, by the way, it never says thou shalt not lie. It says thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Does that help? Well, then you'll have to ask a more specific question because uh, generally talking about the two faces of God is good and evil. I mean, there's nothing else to say. Well, there's a more emphasis on
discrete organized units and certain densities that can become uh, maybe angelic type beings and then maybe uh, not so angelic type beings, you know, counter angelic beings and maybe negative beings, you know, because sometimes information is, is negative information. For everything that is about being, there's also non being. So when I refer to God, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, God. I'm talking about information. And there is information, uh, there is information about good things and there is information about bad things. There is, you know, there is being and there is non-being. Does that help?
and then decided to write the paper and see what happened. <laughs> well, I did write the paper. Later on, I even su succeeded publishing it. <laughs> but when I look at it now, I think, did I wrote it? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it looks like you know, into it. Something that may act as a giving someone intuition to do something, but it was not good. So that was my only attempt. So I preferred to work, and all my life is essentially work while being, so, being sober. Into the science. And also, if you wish to speculate on the nature of uh, the retransmitter, whether well, that would be some sort of material or immaterial. Okay. He wants to know, he says, Gurdjie uh, said that everything is material, everything oh. is matter. And would you comment on that? So oh. just deal with that first. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Kuntia really said that everything is material. At some point, he wrote that knowledge, for instance, is material. But I think his understanding of what is material was different than the understanding that we normally had. Gutierrez was not a scientist. He, here and there, he mentioned something about science, which means he was more of a scientific uh, uh, mind. So, uh, when we, see, we say material, it means somehow reduced to elementary constituents of matter and there is clear evidence I think that not everything can be reduced to that. For instance, if you read Kurjiev's last piece, the Berger book stories, you will find that a lot of stuff that, that, that you find there, in, put, in particular the way he speaks about the universe, cannot be reduced to what we understand as material. So if you think that Ujir was saying that everything is material, I would say uh, I uh, strongly disagree, and I disagree with some other thing that Kujir wrote and what he has done. He's, in a sense, I like quite a bit of what he wrote or what he was teaching, and I dislike quite a bit of what, what he has done. Does everybody want to take a break? I, I notice people, or do we want to shut down? I mean, I notice people are getting a little tired. you have a question? Yeah. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Um, could you share with us the last news that the cancer DNC gave you about the coming the arrival of the wave? Um, the, the very latest news was that 2014 was supposed to be year one of the new reality. They don't usually give dates, but apparently when you start getting closer and closer to something, you know, they didn't give a specific date, they just said 2014 would be year one of the new reality. What that means? We'll see. Casupians are 
very often quite tricky. They trick us. They tell us something in order to test whether we just simply believe or we check. And I often say, I don't want to believe, I want to know. <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks a lot for the conference. I uh, found it very interesting. I've not read anything before here by right chance. Uh, I'd like to know if you have a specific here, explanation or your explanation of the crop circles. Well, we have a, quite a bit of uh, material from the Catholic Canyon about crop, crop circles. They say that they are expressions of thoughts from our identity, that they are transmitting information to us, I mean, maybe even in a language similar to the DNA language, we don't know. Um, I think it might be interesting to compare some of them to, you know, proteins or, you know, find some way to read DNA uh, introns and make some comparisons, but, you know, nobody's really doing that. Uh, there's been so much fakery, because this is, again, one of those phenomena that's just so in your face real and so astonishing and so, I mean, it just blows your mind to look at some of those things and to know that there is some incredibly intelligent, uh, you know, non-material uh, force that is producing those. And then, and then for God's sake, they come along and mow them down. It's like, hey, it's almost like saying, and excuse me for using the term God, but it's like, God is talking to us, but um, go away, quick. Just get this your face. Uh, you know, there are forces in the universe that are communicating with us, and we are faking it, we are, uh, you know, creating fakes to distract it, uh, to distract attention away from real phenomena, knowing the time. It's just, just mind-boggling, it's mind-boggling. And I think they're just, just, they've interpreted some of them. We've got a list of interpretations of specific crop circles. Um, but that's, you know, pretty much it. And it was... Each year, it's more and more difficult to distinguish between which pigheads are real crop circles and which ones are fake, because our technology and the determination to convince everybody that all crop circles are man-made is growing, you see? Yeah, it goes back to this tremendous push by uh, this, this whole 50% of the population to convince everybody else that there is nothing but matter and that the material universe is, is all there is. You know, to, and I think that for some people maybe that's true. Because maybe they are nothing but, you know, an evolved machine uh, with some DNA that they're, they're just, they're just a carrier of the DNA. They, they, they don't have any self-reflection capacities or any evolved capacities that even allow them to, you know, to ask the questions that are being asked here, to think the thoughts that we think, to observe what we observe in the world. You know, fully 50% of the population are like that, I think. Back here, there's, yeah, back there. This lady over here. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm raising my hand. Um, could you elaborate a little bit about your work with the Cyclobiantium? How far along are you with that? Well, I, you know, I, I created the thing. Uh, it was quite a sewing project. It was all it was built out of felt. And she, she's asking about the Cyclobiantium. And at one point, Cassie Vienz told me, they suggested to me that I might enjoy using a Cyclobiantium instead of just sitting there at the board and getting things one letter at a time. And as you know, Psychoman is a darkened chamber where you either you look into a bowl, like a brass bowl of water, or you look into a mirror or something, and you get into a relaxed state and you kind of like read, you know, whatever it is you're reading in that way, in the mirror and in the water. Right? And supposedly that was how Mr. Thomas did. So I constructed the thing, which is like a black felt tent um, and I played with it a little bit, but the truth is, is I really don't have the time. I'm doing so much research, I haven't had time to mess with the kind of magic. 
I've, I've never had anything. Uh, I mean, I've had uh, visions before that occurred spontaneously and when I was under a kind of a stressed condition. And they were as vivid as anything that was, you know, real and physically three-dimensional right in front of me. But I can't say that I've ever had any real success using the psychomantium method. And you know, the truth is, I'm not even sure I trust it. I'm so skeptical, you know. Also, I have a question, I'm sorry. Uh, the Cassiopeians say that you uh, and Art are polar opposites. How do you go about finding your polar opposite in this world? <laughs> well, actually, they didn't say you were polar opposites. That's, that's a, an idea of Boris Moravia. What they said was that we were collinear wave reading consciousness units. <laughs> actually, How romantic. Uh, yeah, it's really it's, uh, hearts and flowers. Um, so it, it just kind of goes back to, I mean, when you think about it, wave reading. You know, consciousness units. It just goes. It, it just fits all in, in all of this material I was talking about tonight. You know, wave reading, and and are talking about the waves. You know, these wavicles and you know, these little shock waves and things, and and information encoded in DNA. You know, I just think this whole thing about uh, us probably carrying, you know, an enormous amount of information right in our DNA. If we could only figure out how to get to it and read it, it's just so absolutely. You know, and maybe that's what I've been doing with the, with this Cassiopeian experiment to some extent. But uh, you know, just think about it. I mean, there you are. You're carrying a, a five thousand volume library around in your body and every cell. It's just incredible. I mean, why aren't we all working on getting able to read it? And, well, I mean, I am. I'm working on it. Well, but I want to add something. <laughs> In a sense, we are really, really polar opposites, you know? Because, for instance, I'm sitting here, and there are these candies. And once in a while, when Laura is not looking at me, I take a candy and put it in my mouth. If she would know that I'm doing it, she would be very angry because sugar is so bad for me. But I'm in Barcelona once, maybe even every 100 years or so, <laughs> so far. So it's an exception, right? So that's how come that bowl is diminishing. <laughs> I thought there looked like there was fewer in there. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Here we have a lady here with a question. Where's our microphone? Uh -huh. missed 
Did, it, did it, everybody else miss that? I mean, did I really, did I really uh, not deliver the goods here? I mean, did everybody else get what I was saying? The point? I think you were driving into the question, what is the purpose of life? And everybody would like to know one sentence answer. <laughs> okay, you want a one sentence answer. The purpose of life is to have a system that survives for billions of years and carries the DNA because it maintains the balance in the universe. Because if it was all this matter in this matter universe, the universe would probably die because it would just, you know, be in trouble. Completely in trouble. But with life in it, it, it continues on. I think it keeps the game going. And you know, basically, you know, we are just part of that system. We're here now. You know, we have some opportunities to make more, maybe a little more than what we actually are. But um, I think that you know, if, if you want to be more than that, we have to do a little more work. I can't hear you. Well, I love that. Uh, yo quería hacer una pregunta, que es, eh, ¿qué opinan sobre, porque parece ser que el movimiento loco de ser humano, parece que hay unos puntos ahí que parece que ha sido manipulado, quería que espe especificase qué puntos son estos, ¿no? Y si no han tenido ustedes relaciones con todo el movimiento de psicología de personal, eh, por ejemplo, no sé si conocen que hay casi dos polos que son el, el California Institute of Integral Studies de Stanley Blackwood y el, y, el, y el otro pueblo de, de Carl Wilber. Si no han tenido contactos con, con toda esta gente, ¿no? con todo este movimiento del de, de nuevo de ser humano, ¿no? la psicología transpersonal, ¿ha quedado claro? Uh, you mentioned on the slides that uh, who is this 
include this information for new designs. You mean you didn't you missed the answer? Okay, the answer was either <laughs> the answer was that there would be an end user, a client user, which would be either some aliens or extraterrestrials who use us to farm us and eat us and use us as, as libraries to read information about our location in the galaxy, or alternatively, it could be the information could have been put there for us to evolve to the point where we could read it ourselves. Remember that? Did I, I, I didn't even say anything, you just forgot, right? Okay, no, and, and my, my idea is, is that it probably is there for us to evolve, to be able to read it, because then we can utilize it to move to another level of reality, and it helps the universe to grow and expand, you know, to, to increase the organization. And it was co-opted by maybe some evil aliens who came along and decided to use us to have, you know, uh, lunch and, and whatever, because I mean, look at all the look at all the cow mutilations and even human mutilations that take place. And people always wonder, you know, what are they what are they doing that for? Well, they're 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 using they're reading the DNA and they're using body parts. And, you know, they're consuming them. So there is evidence that it is being used by a client that the living system, many members of it, humans, animals, and so forth, are being used. But I don't think, uh, unlike Schiller, I don't think that was the intention. I think it was for us, ultimately. See, that's what happens when you listen to me talk. It's like reading my books, you know? You go around and around and around and around, and by the time you're done, you're not sure what you, you know, what's going on. I'm not even sure what's going on. <laughs>
I mean, you gotta learn to be like a ribosome, you know, and read that little strip of DNA and assemble that polypeptide one bead at a time, you know? You can't make any mistakes or you get the wrong protein and everything's screwed up. Then you'll have a foot growing out of your back. <laughs> Hola. Gracias. Hello. Hello. Gracias por insistir y por ser tan investigadora. Eres muy valiente. Mi pregunta es sobre los jet trains, sobre estos aviones que están dejando unas estelas en el cielo y están llenando todo el cielo de esto. Yo creo que es veneno, que, que nos están, digamos, un poco aniquilando. No sé exactamente qué, pero creo que no es nada bueno. Y quería saber si son extraterrestres, si son humanos y también si Obama está con los extraterrestres. about 
some kind of agreement between, you say, the United States government or some government of the world and extraterrestrials. Well, I don't think that that's necessarily true. If anybody here has read Richard Dolan's books, two volumes, uh, UFOs and the National Security State, what you discover in that book is case after case after case after case after case of military interactions with UFOs where the UFO is behaving hostile to the military uh, uh, planes or the military planes are chasing and trying to fire on a UFO. Let me tell you what, I don't think there is agreement. I think that's been put out as propaganda to keep people calm uh, because, you know, I mean, it's, it's like they want, they want people to believe that they are in control of the situation and they're not in control of the situation. There's way too much evidence that, um, that the, the governments of the world are not in cahoots with the, you know, extraterrestrials or ultra-terrestrials, as the case may be, and that, uh, you know, that that's just propaganda. So Obama talking to or being in contact with extraterrestrials would be kind of like, you know, I mean, if he's sending his military to chase them down and fire on them, which has been witnessed many, many times, I don't think he's talking to them. <coughs> Next.
that was trying to imitate paranormal capacities of mind. It sometimes it works, sometimes it does not. And we do not really understand when it works and when it doesn't. It's not under full control of a, a human being, of a military, or of a you know, scientist. So there are prototypes, and they produce the results, but not always. And we, if we want to sell something as a technological product, we want to be sure that it will be working most of the time. Okay, Blackberry or whatever was it, yeah? but there was a crash in recent days, yeah? With a big technology which didn't work. But it happens once, still people will buy it, right? But if you have a technology that works like 50 times, 50% 50 of the time, no one will buy it, and it can be even dangerous to use it. So I think right now it's a human body, human mind, maybe with a little help like Ouija board, you know, uh, but it's just a, to help in some technical, you know, to, to, to spell letter by letter, which is then more reliable because there is less chance of getting noise in this way. If you spell the whole sentence at once, you know the whole, then it can be easily, the meaning can be distorted. If you have to spell letter by letter, Okay, sometimes the letter get distorted, still the meaning will be preserved. So this is some little help, but it's not really a technology. The Ouija board or whatever, you use pendulum for instance, or uh, how you call it, uh, diving rods, dive, yeah? I mean, to, some people use it, they are not really important, but they are reducing noise somehow, okay? But this is not really technology. So I think the, the most important thing, somehow human beings are responsible for what happens, and because of this fortunately, it cannot be resolved. I mean, even the, 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 the successful people who are able to move matter at the distance, you see, telekinesis or whatever. Sometimes it works and some other time it doesn't work and whoever is doing cheats and that's almost the end to the career. I don't think there is a technology that is 100% sure which can do such things, even with an alchemical transmutation. Thank you. This uh, last uh, question reminds me of uh, some experience I had before. Uh, but there was one, one site on the internet and it was called Peter Answers and they type a question and you ask answer, <coughs> ask for answer and, uh, and uh, you get immediately the exact answer. Like you can ask which which uh, is my favorite color? And it guesses, like where I live, what's my name, everything. What I'm doing now. I'm just typing on the <coughs> What's the explanation? Magic. <laughs>
hope that I don't get thrown in prison forever or burned at the stake. We're all with you. Uh, uh, it's easy for you to say that. You know, you're, not, you're not living in the house they're going to raid. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate it, but uh, we don't know what's going to happen. Things are, things are really ugly right now. You should have a donation drive. Well, when my when my legal expenses get get going, I'm definitely going to think about it because having the most famous attorney in France is. Good luck. Yeah.